this is Dennis Williams, and today I want to talk to you a bit about what is history. Uh, and I'm talking about it from the standpoint of a professional historian, somebody who does this for a living. And since you probably don't do this for a living, uh, I want to give you some insight into how historians think about the discipline of history and what it really is. So sort of the first thing to think about when thinking about history is like, what exactly are we talking about here? Now, some people, and it's true, would think that history is the past, sort of this big term, which really means everything that ever happened before this moment in time. And it's true that that is history um, in the, I guess, technical sense in terms of time. There's past, and that's history. There's present, what's happening right now. And then there's future, right? Like the things that haven't happened yet that once they do happen, will pass through the present and turn into the past. But history is more than just the past. Uh, history is um, a story, really, a story that's based on the past, um, and it's based on uh, historians or other people's uh, selection of relevant facts, oftentimes through re done through research, uh, drawn from the best available sources for some particular purpose. And so we can talk about history from the standpoint of like, big history, uh, which starts off with, you know, the beginning of the cosmos, right, which physicists tell us, astronomers tell us, started with this event called the Big Bang. And, you know, history, that story of the past could include, you know, like, uh, what happened before humans even existed, right? Like the dinosaurs and things like that as human beings try to construct an understanding of what happened in the past. But most of the time, when we're talking about history, we're talking about the story of the narrative of what humans have done in the past. And so much of our history is organized around a human story, uh, a human story that's set in a bigger context of like the planet or perhaps even the cosmos. Um, history has utility, right? Um, it, you know, some people would say, oh, history is, you know, a, a, a warning perhaps, uh, or it gives us some insights into, you know, how not to make the same mistakes again, because we look back and we say, oh man, those people really messed up. Um, but really, uh, History is a story that tells us something about who we are as human beings, both the sort of noble and good kinds of aspects of our humanity, but also the ignoble, the, the negative things that we've done to one another on the planet or done to the planet itself. History is a story about technology. History is a story about the way people treated one another. History is the story about big dreams that become reality or, or that people try to make reality. But ultimately, uh, as Robert Penn Warren said, and you can see that little little image there at the bottom left part of the screen, history cannot give us a program for the future, but it can give us a fuller understanding of ourselves and our common humanity so that we can better face the future. And so looking at history from the standpoint of, you know, all the optimism and the great things that, you know, we've done, but also looking at it very honestly and saying, you know what, uh, we don't live up to our ideals very well. And, you know, maybe uh, bad things will happen in the future, but we also have resilience and courage, and, and we've seen people do that in the past, and so perhaps we can do it too. When we think about the purpose of history, which I've kind of begun transitioning to in that uh, previous slide, uh, history has a variety of purposes. Uh, history is entertaining, right? I mean, we can be observers of the past, and we can say, wow, you know, that was bizarre what those people did in the past, right? Or how, how could they even do, have done that? And it can be inspiring, right? Like, oh, wow, those people faced really horrible situations and they came out of it. They solved problems or they did whatever. Uh, history is also about, you know, preserving our cultural heritage, our, our memory of the past. And that shapes our identity. Uh, it reinforces our sense of togetherness, or perhaps it reinforces our you know, separateness as well, depending on the way we tell that story about the past, the kinds of, of details that we choose to uh, select and assemble uh, with one another. And I'm talking about this uh, in this particular, on this particular day, because I'm 
recording this to talk about Latin American history uh, down the road, and so this is going to fit into my Latin American history class. And so the images that you see, you know, on the screen here are images that relate to, you know, things that are are, are part of that experience of the Latin American past. Uh, history also communicates values, and so that's like mythology, right? Um, and so we oftentimes tell stories not just to tell the story, but to to tell something bigger, right? To 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 suggest what we really value. We select those kinds of details to say, oh, well, this is the these are the important things, the significant things, because this is what we value. Uh, it explains origins, right? It explains you know how we got to this particular moment in time, uh, what kinds of of activities, what kinds of actions, what kinds of behaviors, what kinds of events, you know, have shaped our understanding of this moment, of how we relate to one another, those kinds of things. Uh, History, as mentioned in that previous slide, is about humanity, right? It's about building empathy. So we can, you know, look at the way people did things in the past, and we can look at, you know, the various actors in those those stories, and we can say, wow, you know, all of those people were human beings, and I'm a human being too, so I can can fit myself into that story. I can use my imagination to imagine, you know, what it would be like to be, you know, the, the elite, the powerful. What would I have done? What would it be, have been like to be on the other side of that, the oppressed perhaps, or, you know, whatever? And so in that regard, history helps us understand human beings and be able to empathize with them, and in fact, being able to empathize with ourselves as well to understand what's going on in us as human beings. History is also um, a, a, a practical tool, right? Uh, understanding how to do history helps us solve problems and think critically. We can learn from our mistakes, perhaps. Um, we can learn about our mistakes and and how people chose particular strategies to deal with them. And sometimes those strategies were successful, and sometimes those strategies might not have been successful. It can help us make informed decisions. You know, if we look at all of the the, the factors, the the you know small events that that when assembled together led to you know some kind of larger decision that worked or didn't work we can look at that and we can say well how does that apply to what we're facing today and you know does that give us any insight into making good decisions today um and history can also be used to resolve conflicts and many times that has something to do with being honest Right, so you know we can tell these these grand narratives, these big stories about you know how we came to be and justify ourselves in in terms of our behaviors. But when we empathize with the other uh, and we tell honest stories about how perhaps we screwed up in the past and and harmed people in the past, and get honest about that and and can say, "Hey, I'm sorry," like that. That was wrong, and we're not going to do that again. Uh, we're going to move forward in a different way. Uh, that can begin to, you know, take some of the the sting out of oppression and take the sting out of, you know, bad behaviors from the past. When we can just admit to our to our weaknesses and admit to our sins against one another, and then resolve to do things differently in the future. And so, history has a, a number of different purposes, and it plays. You know that space uh, for you know helping us be better people, perhaps, or give us the opportunity at least to be better people in the future. Historians um, are different than perhaps the first wave of storytellers, the journalists that we call them today, in that you know we apply some pretty different kinds of methods to try to get at you know, what the facts of the matter were to get at different perspectives on what, you know, went into the creation of the events that we, um, that, that we tell stories about, right? Most of the time, historians are mostly interested in, you know, the written word, uh, the kinds of things that people wrote down. That's the best way that we know about to sort of get into the minds of the people at the time uh, to get, you know, a sort of a, a glimpse in the moment of what people were thinking about, what people were doing, etc. And most of those documents are found in libraries and archives and things like that. 
um, archives, we have stored, you know, these very old documents that people thought were significant and important. Now, recognize that oftentimes people throw away a lot of documents that they don't think are important that we really wish we had now because they might give us insight into a completely different part of the story that we don't have access to because the documents don't exist anymore. So archives are really important because at least they're the kinds of things that people saved because they thought they were important along the way, and they're filled with these historical documents. If we're talking about the recent past, if we're trying to tell a story about, you know, something that happened, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, perhaps, uh, historians also interview people who were participants at the time. We do oral history interviews, and so we go out and we find the people that played a role in it, and we talk to them about their story, and we let them tell their story from their perspective. And then we assemble you know, those various stories that people tell us and say, so what really happened? Anytime you have two people telling a story, they're telling it from their own perspective, and we recognize that that perspective is colored and biased uh, by that person's experience, by that person's background, by that person's values. And so historians try to be somewhat objective and say, well, this person told the story this way, another person's told the story another way, so what was it, you know, that that really happened. So the truth is usually somewhere in the middle of the stories that, that the perspectives that people tell their story from. Historians also, um, you know, rely on the work of other historians. We call those secondary sources. So some other historian uh, tells a uh, a research-based account of events from what they've been able to assemble. And so we take that and we build on that and we ask different kinds of questions, new questions, go get some more primary source evidence, those historical documents, perhaps oral history interviews, other kinds of things. And we say, so what more can we tell? How can we tell the story a little differently that gets at perhaps a little closer to the truth, possibly? Uh, and we use secondary sources to help us with that. Historians also work inside of this larger narrative, this larger story. We call it historiography, right? So you have 20 or 30 historians working on a similar kind of topic or a similar kind of area. They all have their perspectives. And one of the ways that we try to understand it is say, you know, from a particular philosophical or value perspective, this is the way that story looks. From a different one, it looks a different way. And when we start telling about how historians have ter interpreted the past, we're talking about something called historiography. Uh, historians also, you know, this is the digital age, right? So we've been able to capture a lot of information that we preserve digitally. So statistics and things like that can be, you know, analyzed uh, using computer technology. Um, databases and things like that. So we're able to get at more than just what people wrote down, you know, their own analysis, but we can get at some, you know, basic kinds of evidence, you know, what, what, how many things were sold, what did the economy look like, and we can get data that can tell us about that. We can also look at art and film, uh, things that perhaps are preserved now in digital formats. Um, and, you know, we can use this this art perspective in the digital humanities to assemble, you know, primary source documents, data, art, movies, literature, all those kinds of things, and pull it all together to sort of tell the story by showing some of the the the, the records of the past to help people go, oh, okay, it's not just somebody telling me this, but I can see it for myself. And we can use the computer technology that we have today, the internet, etc., to assemble those things and tell a story that's visible. Uh, and it sort of makes the, the methodology transparent. Um, I mentioned quant quantitative analysis, looking at you know statistics and things like that uh, to tell a, a bit of a story. There are also people who are not historians, but they're in you know what we call adjacent disciplines, right? So archaeologists, people who you know go and dig up the evidence of the past. They dig up artifacts and they try to make a story you know, that they can tell about the, the artifacts that we find, you know, in the ground from civilizations that we might not have very many written records to tell us that story. We can't talk about the day-to-day -day life because nobody really wrote it down. So archaeologists can sort of dig up, you know, from the, the trash pits or, you know, monuments or things like that and really investigate them and maybe get at something that goes beyond the written story that we can tell that maybe uncovers 
uh, some different parts of the story that the biases of the people who wrote it, there's a saying, you know, victors write the history, um, elites write the history. So what can we say about common people who didn't write things down? Well, we can know something about that by the artifacts that they left. Also, there are peoples in the world that are, we call it pre-literate. They're, they don't write things down. They tell stories uh, to one another around, you know, the campfire or around the the, the living room or something like that. And so there are a group of scholars out there called ethnographers who have, you know, traveled the world, uh, gone into uh, cultures and, and, and societies where the written word is not the dominant way of communicating information, and they listen to their stories, and they watch how they act and how they live, and they try to, to describe uh, the life way of a particular group of people in order to give us some insight into how those people lived when we're not going to likely have documents about how that works. We also use um, mapping, uh, geographical information systems to, you know, give us some insight into, you know, landscapes or the built environment or things like that where, you know, the documents probably aren't going to exist, but maps can help us lay in different types of data on top of a space to understand how it developed through time. And then there are liter- literary studies, right? So our, our colleagues that study literature are taking, you know, these, these written accounts, right? These, you know, novels or, um, you know, songs or, you know, poetry or any of those other forms of literature. And, you know, thinking about how they came to be in context, what their power was, what their utility was. And so we can take the information that literary scholars develop and we can apply that or bring that in to the historical narrative. And then ultimately, historians think about all of that data that they're bringing in, all of those documents and secondary sources and that historiographical understanding all the data points from quantitative methods. They pull all of that together, and then they think critically about it, and then they build an interpretation, uh, uh, their perspective on what the truth is about the story that they're about to tell. And that takes critical thinking and interpretive skills. And historians have a set of concepts that they work with uh, in order to develop these stories. Um, Some of those skills are on this slide here, right? So the first thing historians do is they ask the question, like, what's significant? So there's all the things of the past, like everything that ever happened. When you walked out the door this morning, you know, you started collecting data about the world around you. You collected data about, you know, is it, was it cloudy or was it sunny? You know, was it warm or was it cold? And, you know, all these sorts of, of, of all this information flows into our minds uh, or into our brains anyway, and then we select particular parts of that information to help guide you know, our behavior for the day. Um, and historians do the same thing. We look at the past and say, of all the things that we might be able to know about the past, what is the most important thing that I want to be able to talk about? And so we establish something called historical significance, what really mattered. Uh, in the past, and that changes depending on the subject of the of the te- of the of the narrative or the story that people are going to tell. But hist- establishing, oh, this is the most important thing um, that I want to talk about, is establishing that significance. Um, historians use primary source evidence, so we try to get as close to the time as we possibly can to get information that was, if best, perhaps observed by the people who were taking part in the actual events and getting their very close to the events perspective on it. And sometimes, you know, people write diaries or they write, you know, journals or they write, you know, books or articles about some particular thing that they're being involved in right now. Um, They write a document like a, a, a law or a code of law or the Declaration of Independence or a constitution or something like that. And that occurred right at the time of the event, and so we consider that primary source evidence, and we say that the closer you can get to the time, the more accurate, perhaps, we can can understand the, the events of the time. Historians like to think in terms of continuity and change, so what stayed the same and what happened that made things different. 
And so we're always looking for, you know, these the, the balance point between t- let's tell a story about how things didn't change and let's tell a story about what things did change. And then let's try to figure out, you know, what caused the change, because people tend to not like change very much. We tend to hang on to what we call the status quo. And so people are somewhat resistant to change unless they're sort of forced into it. And so when we're looking at change, we're looking at, so what forced people to actually expend energy to do something different than what they were comfortable with uh, doing before? And so we're always kind of looking for that. Historians analyze causes and consequences. That's our big question. What caused this event? What were the consequences of this event? So the event itself is is interesting, but we're really looking on you know both sides of it to try to understand it in this sort of larger context and this larger significance, cause and consequence. And then we take you know various historical perspectives. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're looking at the past and we're trying to understand like the the narrative flow of the human experience, and we're looking at it from the perspective of. I didn't participate in this. I want to understand what that happened, what happened during that time, and I want to set it into a context so that I can understand the big picture of the events that took place in the past, how people behaved in the past, and I'm going to do that as objectively as I can, try to tell the most truthful story that I can, regardless of what my own um, desired perspective might be. I've got to be honest and, and ethical um, and have integrity to tell the true story. Um, and of course, you know, people, we're, we're faced with our, you know, political environment today where sometimes people aren't, don't seem to be very interested in the true story. They're just interested in persuading people that their perspective is the right perspective. And historians do that to some extent. We make arguments to try to, to, to persuade others that our interpretation is correct, but we also have a certain kind of humility that says, you know what, this is the best story I can tell given the available evidence, but it's not necessarily like the whole story, and I recognize that, and there are other ways to look at this. And so historians professionally are always sort of couching this in terms of, you know, here's a story, but there's a bigger story here, and I just have the time and energy and focus to tell this part of the story. And I'm going to let other historians tell the other parts of the story, um, and we'll assemble with all of our different narratives uh, something as close to the uh, story, a big story as close to the truth as we can find. And then we also have to understand that there are you know ethical dimensions to this, and and I've mentioned that a little bit before. It's like, we've got to tell the truth, um, and we've got to look at things from an ethical perspective as well. So it's not only telling the truth and treating people that we study with respect and uh, try to be inclusive and all of those sorts of things, but we also have to like um, tell stories that help us become, as, as a, large, a greater people, um, better. And so when we see things in the past that we would consider unethical today, we call it out and we tell that story because understanding how we misbehaved in the past, at least relative to what we think good behavior is today, um, is important because if we tell those kinds of stories, then we have an opportunity to acknowledge uh, where we also foul up and how to do that better. Ultimately, uh, historians are historical beings. And what does that mean? It means that we human beings, perhaps more than any other species, at least that we know about, um, are, are organisms that rely very heavily on the past in order to inform our present and give us a sense of where we can go in the future. And that's built on the human capacity to imagine and to communicate with one another through language. And so human beings imagine worlds that aren't present today. They don't exist today in this moment. Um, and, and through that imagination, we 
envision what we would like to see in the future. We don't like what we have today, so we ima- imagine a, a better future, and then we start working towards it. And we use language to communicate those images in our mind to one another to try to inspire other people to ally with us and, and to be motivated to come on board to create the future that we want. And that process of creating a new future a different one from the one that we have in this present moment is what creates the fodder or the material for history because we're looking in the past and we're saying how did people actually go from point A, which was a very different kind of experience than we had, to point C, which is a somewhat different experience than they had but still not the experience that we have, and sort of work their way up progressively, I'm going to use that word, and I'm going to use like air quotes around it, uh, because, you know, progress doesn't necessarily mean, in this case, getting better, better, and better, but progress means making changes through time to, to move away from one state and towards another state that ultimately ends up in our present. And we use our complex language skills to not only communicate like ideas, but also to communicate emotions. And emotions are what drive people to like join up with one another and inspire them to do different things than what they do. And we can create through language, you know, these emotions like sorrow or excitement or motivation. We can use language to isolate people and push them away from us, or we can use language to create emotions of inclusion and connection. And so the human being, you know, uses all of these tools to, cr- to create history in some ways, to create change through time and a, and a story that's leading to something that we would imagine is better than the state of being we have today. Though it might not turn out better, we imagine that it might. And so historical narratives create kind of a shared identity uh, and projects an imagined future. Uh, and we presume then that what happened in the past can happen in the present to make a different kind of future. And so we look back in time and we say, how did those people actually accomplish that great thing, that great change? And can we figure out the techniques that they use, the tools that they use, the approaches that they use, and can we bring that forward into our present and those ideas or those lessons forward into our present and then use them to do something different? All right, so hopefully that gives you some insight into what is history and how a professional historian understands history and how it's done. Uh, Thanks for watching.